All right, so back inside my house, I've brought my bags of groceries in, and I just thought I might unload a few things and talk a little bit, um, just so you can get to know me a little bit if you don't know me already. So um, just to let you know, um, as I was saying in the intro video, um, as I was driving home, it just occurred to me that I would want to try to start um, this series of just some things about me. Again, I'm not an expert. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I, and first of all, forgive my hair, um, just got home, uh, went to the store right after uh, grabbing some breakfast after dragon boat paddling with my team. So anyway, forgive me, I haven't showered yet, I'm looking a little rough, but um, I just thought I'd do this impromptu, let you get to know me a little bit. So um, I am obviously middle-aged, I um, have some health history that uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about as, as um, time goes by and I do a little bit more um, detail with this to see what the interest is. Um, but uh, I'm 50 and I turned 50 the beginning of this year and um, I've had some health issues throughout the year. Uh, I started off um, pretty healthy um, but I am uh, really a type A. I'm always um, a driver on things. I worry about things. I don't sleep the greatest. And it really has taken a toll through my life. And one of the, the most recent things that really impacted my health was um, I developed um, a mass in my pelvis and it wound up being um, a very rare type of ovarian cancer. Um, so rare that uh, when I had it removed locally by uh, oncology gynecologist it was sent to Harvard so part of me actually is um, I guess considered Ivy League studied anyway and um, it was a very rare type of tumor and um, I'll probably post some more information on that somewhere else another time but um, you know stressors on my life have played a big impact and um, I, that that's really critical in this whole thing because um, once I was forced through surgical menopause um, very abruptly, because this was five years, about five years, six years ago, I guess now. Um, wow, it was really, really um, a monstrous impact on my whole body right away. First of all, I have to say I'm grateful. My tumor was surgically removed with the margins intact, and the feeling was, even with the pathologist at Harvard, that um, I did not need to have chemotherapy. Um, or radiation treatment that I was monitored closely for quite a while and um, so far so good so that's a great thing I'm excited by it but the thing is is I was really forced into menopause surgically immediately like that maybe some some people might argue that I was perimenopause um, just because of my age range like 45 ish or something um, but anyway having your ovaries removed at the same time was really a shocker um, just to on a high level, um, let it suffice to say that um, I truly thought that I had some edema in my abdomen and pelvis as I recovered. I thought there was a complication from my surgery. And come to find out, I was very rapidly developing abdominal fat um, when I realized that that wasn't edema. It wasn't puffy from swelling or, or fluid. It was actually my fat getting thick, like quickly. Um, and wow, that was a shocker. I had hot flashes right away. Luckily, um, I was allowed to go on estrogen shortly thereafter um, once they got the rest of the reports from the guy from Harvard, the physician from Harvard, and um, that helped the, the hot flashes. But my life the last few years has just been um, gain weight super easily. I'm very active. Um, I, I work out regularly. Um, my leisurely weeks were probably the equivalent of what most people's busy weeks are as far as exercise goes. And uh, I really didn't overeat. Um, I basically followed Mediterranean diet and um, did have a couple glasses of wine a night usually. Um, but other than that, nothing um, overindulgent um, and actually less intake than I had until um, the, the surgery. And I still was plump. I was round. I, you know, I'll post some pictures. Um, for those of you who've only really known me the last couple of years, it's all you've ever known, probably. Um, just thick around the middle, round face. I did look younger, by the way, um, but uh, just very unhappy. Didn't feel good. I was achy all the time. I'd get up out of bed and hobble after a really hard workout and um, just didn't wasn't happy with myself, wasn't happy with my performance. So anyway, I've been researching for the holy grail. There is none um, for females, middle-aged. 
Um, it's, I think most of you know that um, a lot more money, research and development goes into, you know, erectile dysfunction for men than even heart health for women. Le very disappointing. I'm only beginning to scratch the surface of this and I'm hopeful that again, this is a platform that will springboard into something um, to talk about women's health and why I feel we need to have some more attention put on that. So anyway, um, read a lot of different hormonal things. I'm not going to cite any literature right now. Never really found exactly what I was seeking. A lot of great research on cortisol and stress and things like that and how that contributes to um, adiposity or, or, or gaining um, fat in like your trunk, which is pretty typical for middle-aged people, men too. But I tell you what, you know, through the years, it really just, it clicked on me because for the last many, many years, um, in my um, role in healthcare, I'm actually in health analytics, health and wellness. What um, I work with um, for a large national insurance company that partners with employer um, sponsored um, health plans. And we work with them, we analyze data, let them know the demographics of the people, how they're utilizing um, healthcare dollars, and what can we do to actually make an impact on this. And a lot of times it's, you know, stopping the bleeding. There's a problem with people getting surgeries unnecessarily or what have you. But ultimately it comes down to risk reduction. So when I was finally, you know, when I was at my, my breaking point with what am I going to do with this Pillsbury Doughboy kind of middle or whatever, I'm like, it clicked. This is all the same kind of stuff that I'm talking to my employers about. What can you do to reduce risk when you have employees that stay on your health plan, etc.? It was the same thing for me. I just couldn't find exactly what the solution was. And I'm not saying that a ketogenic diet is the solution by any stretch of the means, but I think it's a huge, huge light bulb moment for this country, for healthcare, for providers, for people. And that's why I want to um, start doing this on behalf of my friends. Um, it's uh, when I found this information a few months ago, it brought together all these different things I'd been reading about cortisol, stress, um, diabetes, um, a propensity to develop it from insulin resistance, physical activity, don't do too much, don't do too little, um, all these crazy things that nothing was quite the solution for me. And I read this and I felt like it sounded right, sounded like a good novel idea. And I have to say, I'm not even sure how I found it. I started um, somehow or another, you know how the internet now, one link leads to another and all those ads and all that stuff. I clicked on something and um, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, um, a professor at USF College of Medicine, School of Medicine, University of Medicine, I think it's College of Medicine. Anyway, had some really cool stuff out there. I think um, he does a lot of stuff on YouTube. I'm sure um, his lectures are really helping to support um, his cause, but he's got some great research out there. I was struggling for scientific, not just anecdotal stuff out there, you know, on YouTube, and I watched several, several um, uh, videos. Thank goodness for YouTube. My God, you don't have to read a book anymore. Although hopefully you go ahead and do the research yourself after you get turned on to something. But anyway, this whole thing really stuck for me. It really stuck. It resonated in me. It's like, wow, this whole carbohydrate thing and the cravings and, and, and the impact on our bodies and with this constant need for every two or three hour eating, um, what it's doing to our insulin levels and then our glucose levels and then our insulin levels and our glucose levels. And I'm like, oh my God, I've seen my own fasting glucose levels throughout the year slowly creep up. I'm still within normal limits. I, none of the, the ranges would consider that I'm a, a, a pre-diabetic even, but I'm seeing these levels change. I'm seeing these changes in my labs. I'm seeing some different things. I'm seeing that I don't have risk for certain things, but then again, others. And it just really clicked. So I was, I was really hooked. And so I started reading more and watching more videos and finding more research and realizing what propaganda it is. Um, one of the biggest things was, and I have to show you this, I probably have it in one of my bags, I'm gonna unpack it in a minute. But um, when I read the uproar and saw on um, a YouTube video the, the uproar on the whole coconut oil and how the American Heart Association has issued a statement on coconut oil, um, that it's a saturated fat and it's bad. And when you read all this stuff about fats and, and good fats, 
and what what it does to your body to have fat and you realize all the unfounded research on replacing fats with carbohydrates low fats and you see the the bar charts that show the correlation with um, the overweight and obese um, percentages in this country that that are just parallel with the whole oh we need to cut fats out of our diet I mean I think back I'm 50 years old moms and dads were not overweight for the most part there were some but there weren't a lot but even those people were not diabetic think about it I mean for those of you that are my age or around my age sugar I'm from West Virginia so we'd say a touch of the sugar he's got a touch of the sugar that was like really you know people late late in life man it was not chubby kids developing type 2 diabetes I don't know there's a problem and I really feel that this stuff makes sense a ketogenic diet and the research that's out there makes sense so I'm gonna stop this video because this turned a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be it's sort of my introduction part two and then I'm just gonna start another one and I'm gonna walk you through some of the things that I bought um, on my grocery trip today um, spent way more than I intended to stocked up more but as I'd said before um, I hadn't chopped in a few weeks and I, I, the, the cupboard was bare after I had evacuated for um, the hurricane. So anyway, I'm Beth Myers. I'm getting ready to you know, walk some of my friends through why a ketogenic diet um, is something that I believe in and why I think you should research it um, for yourself as well. So thank you and um, more to come.